hey, I'm Jim from Gore-Tex. I'd like to sponsor you. Now, are you so tied to the hoodie that you're going to be like, fuck no? Or are you, what are you saying? Do you wear a sweatshirt that says Gore-Tex on it? <laughs> you are listening to the Bomb Hole. Bomb Hole Podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the Bomb Hole. Gonna slide down in big hills, you know what I mean? On the big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. Welcome to the bomb hole presented by Solomon Snowboards, Stony Buds. What is happening? I'm good, dog. <laughs> nice. Love I kind of have like a uh, what is it? Uh, Groundhog Day of you asking me what happened. We're just, just be- live in this booth. Just beating the dead horse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so today we have Mr. Lane Knack. Lane, how we doing? Doing great. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here with you guys. Good to see some old friends. Where are you coming in from today, Lane? We just drove in from Reno, Nevada, and on our way cross country to move to New Hampshire. You guys should see this guy's rig. He's got the camper. He's towing everything he owns behind it. Everything that wouldn't fit in the pod. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, you shipped a pod, too. Yeah. We had a lot of crap. Yeah, you. Uh, it adds up after 14 years, huh? Yeah, well, that's the trailer's just the toys, I guess. Ah. Well, Griswold's uh, family vacation going on with the the kiddos, the dog. Oh, Try not to leave the dog tied to the bumper. <laughs> <laughs> we looked like we were going to Burning Man. We were posted up out by the salt flats last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's run it back to where you grew up in the early days in VT. Where are you from originally? I went to high school in southern Vermont. I grew up outside Woodstock, New York before that in, like, grade school. Um, grew up riding at uh, Hunter Mountain, Bel Air, High Mount, and then Stratton and Bromley, Okima Mountain in my uh, more formative years. And then uh, you rode with uh, DK back in the day at Okemo, correct? Yes. We went to high school together. We started doing contests together when we were around like 12. And then, yeah, over the years, ended up going to high school together at Okemo and causing some trouble there. And uh, you had some really dope early sponsors when I remember back in the day, right? Yes. I definitely had some good ones when I was a kid. Rode for Burton for quite a while. And then through uh, Seth Neary, got hooked up with Tommy Hilfiger. Lasted a good year before... They blew all their money on him and some other stuff. And Neary got you on Hill Figure. Yeah. Wow. Pretty rad. They made me like they only gave me one outfit. It was like a full custom kit. It was huge, just baggy as shit. But it was like right after like ninety three, ninety four, like everything you had to have was baggy as all hell. It was awesome. Yeah, that was a time for it. Can we just give uh Seth an air horn? That absolutely that dude definitely <laughs> deserves holding it down for God. the East. <laughs> yes. Maybe hit him a little young genius. One of those well. two. <laughs> it's a double header. Also, I remember this isn't in chronological order, but the black dot, the black dot pants. Uh, yes. Heavy sag. Heavy sag. They didn't make a lot of big stuff. It was kind of short on my tall ass, so I had to sag the crap out of it just to make them fit down to the bottom of my bindings. What's the black dot? That was one of uh, the outerwear sponsors. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was like a. It was owned by London Fog. Oh, so it was wow. like Buku Bucks. Like they had so much money. We're always doing rad stuff. Like first year they wanted to do their catalog shoot and they're like, where do you want to go? And it was me and Rocket Reeves and just jokingly were like, oh, let's go to Alaska. And they brought us up there. I was like 19, went up heli boarding for a week and just to shoot photos with Mark Gallup for a catalog. It was with little, Rocket. Yeah. Wow, dude. A little out of my element, a little ridiculous. But yeah, just stuff like that. Like they had tons of money and wanted to put it into some snowboarders. So hell, I'll sell out. That's we all do when we take a paycheck, I guess. So yeah, exactly. What's the difference if they're down to send you Alaska? Yeah, with Rocket too. He he was in his element, I imagine. Oh yeah. How did you get linked up with Rocket in that team? Uh, Greg Manning, G Man, G Man. Yeah, Damn, he dude. was running their program. We were in Hood and went out drinking and woke up the next day with this guy's business card in my pocket and gave him a shout. And it was Greg and had a good relationship with him for a really long time. It was pretty awesome. G Man was definitely legend. Yeah. Of the East. Yep. That's how OG. the PTSP. Yep. That's how the deals were made uh, back in the days, you know, after a heavy night of drinking, huh? Mm-hmm. A lot of no better way to do it, right? Absolutely. Except or for maybe sober during night. <laughs> during the heavy night of drinking, I think they were made. I've definitely seen some uh bar napkin 
contracts. True. I've seen some of those as well. <laughs> for like big brands too. Let's like, talk about that. What just who, who's who signed those? I just remember seeing stuff when we were younger, like especially when we were doing grenade, like it was all mayhem back then. So you definitely see people who are like, look at who I got to sign on last night. You just look at a piece of paper, you're like, holy shit, that's a little ridiculous, but Awesome. I'm awesome. pretty sure they have other sponsors that won't let them do this, but good good on you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's probably percentage of the company included and I'm all sure sorts of all shit. sorts of shenanigans back then. I remember at one point they had sold the company like two and a half times or something like that or given it away. It was Well, they had so they had mayhem. sold so many shares, they sold more shares than there was. Mm-hmm. So they actually couldn't sell the company for a little bit mm-hmm. until they cleared out because there was like he owned some, he owned some, he owned some. So they, uh, yeah, they had to clear who up, kind of like who o- actually Oprah owned it. Winfrey giving out stuff to the crowd, you know, basically Everybody giving out shares. shares. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody owned that thing. So let's back it up to those early days of, uh, you know, the rise of of the Grenade crew. You guys were fucking gods amongst mere mortals. <laughs> True, <laughs> right? That was a that was a fun time. We all kind of grew up back east together, doing the Green Mountain Series contests from like the mid nineties on and all got to the point where we were just like, Oh, let's go check out mammoth. And Danny's older brother, Matt lived in mammoth at the time. So we, the year we were seniors in high school, I remember we cruised out and checked out mammoth that spring and bought a season's pass. We're like, we're doing this next year. And the next year we moved out and a whole bunch of us, like nine, 10 of us living in a house. We had another bunch of friends that were all same crew that lived in the trailer park. And we all just partied all night, rode all day and just, Yeah. Had fun and a little little nuts at times, but good <laughs> let's, times. Let's for talk sure. about that roster. Of yeah, like, we got Clancy, Danny, uh, Clancy, Danny, Brian Regis, uh, shoot Shane Flood, Flood, Charlie Morais, Scotty Arnold, Eddie Wall, Jeff Anderson. Like there was so many people. Dave Schiff, Kevin Casillo. There was a lot of people back then that were all there, and then like the filmers, like Jared Slater, that. Went on to do some crazy stuff. Kurt Morgan, everybody knows what he does. Kurt like, Morgan was up in there too. Yeah, he uh, he came out. I think the second year we were like, the second year Grenade was going when they did Full Metal Edges. He was out. He came out and did a bunch of filming and helped out with that. And then he was a huge part of the movies for a few years after that. And then Jared Slater was the man behind the movies, like the main producer of them. So crazy. It's good times. Good crew. Yeah. Pure mayhem for a while. Mayhem. Yeah. Mammoth was the fucking place at that point in time. Right? It was the, it was happening. It was, yeah, it was the spot. Like, I'll never forget when I first moved there. Like, I same as you. Like, I grew up on all the old snowboard movies and watched everything just religiously. And you get out to Mammoth that first year and you're riding up the chairlift and you're watching the people ride in the park and you're literally watching, like, people filming for these movies right underneath you and you just, it's, insanity at that point just so cool to watch and like like biggest thing for me was always kevin jones every time you'd see him out trading like coolest human but watching him snowboard in person is fucked up Mm -hmm. that dude is good what year did you move out to mammoth 2000 2000 okay yeah fall of 2000 lost i think that's the same year i moved here or 99 maybe just trying to get a time frame of what when you guys were there yeah we moved out in 2000 and i think that Coming spring 2001 is when Grenade started to get shaped and, like, Danny started winning all those contests and had a bunch of money and Matt was just super smart and all that stuff. So he kind of just took it and ran with it and Danny funded it and we all just repped it as hard as we could and turned it into whatever we could. When they were making movies, would they, like, help you guys get around and make everything happen or is it relying on other companies or... Well, everybody had their sponsors. They used all their yeah, all their payroll for all that. Danny really helped me a bunch because I like I always made enough money to live and do whatever. But like when we go on the like the RV trips, Danny would just front everything and pay for all the gas and just drive us all around. And we all just stayed in the RV, so that was all on him. And he paid for the production of the first movie, and then they started getting sponsors. And but yeah, it was a uh, everybody kind of helped out, chipped in, did whatever they could to get through and get by those first couple of years. How many dudes in the RV are we talking? Shoot. That first year we had the RV was, I think we do like nine or 10 guys in that thing driving around, but you got to figure nine or 10 people going to Colorado in the middle of winter when it's cold and you're not outside and everyone's got all of their gear. 
Tight quarters. Really tight quarters. And energy. everybody's <laughs> fucking smoking weed. Getting <laughs> fucked up. It's mayhem. Yeah, that thing was awesome. I'll never forget, like, getting pulled over by cops, and they would literally, like, stand behind the thing and yell at the driver to come out, and you'd open the door and smoke would come billowing out of it, and you'd walk back, and it was like something out of a really bad movie. But <laughs> nobody ever got arrested. Nobody ever got really hurt. Nobody ever got in that much trouble, but, yeah, talking to the cops out of that thing was just constant. I can't believe nobody got arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Such a such a cool era, thinking back. Like, people my age, like, the grenade crew fucking shaped us. I remember at one point taking a, making a handmade grenade stencil and spray painting it on, like, my parents' garage floor and, like, spray painting these homemade grenade stencils on shit. And then even the one fad that... For the listeners that can't see, um, me and Buds are both wearing cut-off sleeve hoodies, which was uh, made popular by Shane Flood and Lane Knack. Uh, and can you talk about this phenomenon, <laughs> the cut-off sleeve hoodie that was so hot at, at that time? That was awesome. I lived in those for years, but I stole that from Bo's Nuts. Oh, really? That was something I saw him doing and loved I've seen it. him do that, yeah. It was just the coolest shit ever, and... I repped it forever, but it was, yeah, it was depending on where you were, how cold it was, it was either two and a half or three and a half hoodies to go out, and that was always the half hoodie. <laughs> keeps so the core, it keeps the core warm. Yeah, well, when you're in Colorado and it's like 30 below zero and you're out shredding it, like especially like go to like the Veil Session night contest and it's like 40 below zero and you have three and a half sweatshirts on, you're not cold. Well, that actually brings me back to the time I went to the Veil Session with you. Oh, yeah. And I remember specifically <laughs> we were riding and, and you had made finals and you were very nervous. And there was something you did to relax before finals. Do you remember what that is? You're talking about smoking blunts in the woods behind the start mound? Uh, I remember you said to me, you're like, I was so nervous I went in the bathroom and jacked off. <laughs> oh, yeah, the condo before we left, yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant up on the hill, yeah. That's a definite <laughs> nerve nerve releaser. You want to calm yourself down? That works like a charm every time. So we got some intel. I was talking to Red earlier, and he was actually saying, uh, I don't know if we're allowed to release this or not, but who gives a shit? He was saying that you don't want to do it morning of. Jello likes. That was yeah. his thing. Jello likes. No yeah. way, dude. Morning of, best way to do it. Yeah, he. I guess it's to each their own, huh? Yeah. And I bet some coach told him that, and... He just lives by it now. I bet yeah. he's never tried it. So, team manager knowledge. Yeah, team manager so knowledge. I don't know. Let's just back it up. So you're saying that the jack-off before the event, it does have the desired effect as far as keeping you chill. Keeping oh, yeah. Up. It's like woo-saw. <laughs> it's like doing yoga before. <laughs> yeah. It's a different form of yoga. It, it is stretching. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like some of these guys like Red and them aren't really nervous before their contest after talking with them. True. You know, They hit those parts. Yeah, jumps. so maybe that's why they don't do it because if you're not nervous, you don't need to do it. Yeah, yeah. They're just so used to it, you know, that yeah. they are not. I almost feel like they just get excited when it's contest time. Yeah. How'd you end up doing in the contest? Oh, horrible. I never did well. Oh, so but Let's talk about the run that you made finals because that was the first year, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean White did all four 900s or 1080s. Mm -hmm. In the same contest? And, and him and Andreas were both fighting for the first person to do four 1080s or 900s. I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was 1080s. It was 1080s. And Lane made finals. Tell him your run, as I remember it, if you don't. I did a front five, a cab five, a front three, and a back seven, and then the rails. Here's the Style. deal. He's forgetting he did front five double stiffy. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, cab, cab five double stiffy. Yes. And there's all like these, like, full rigid yeah, stiffy? Yeah, full lock yeah. legs. Wow, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and then. That's a dope move. And then uh, the best thing is these. there's all these motherfucking nerd contest guys doing like 900s, like slapping their board for two seconds, like winging it around, you know, not making finals. And this guy comes through with two 540s and a 720 and makes finals. It was amazing. With a rigid stiffy. Yeah, rigid stiffy. That might have, yeah, I guess it was post and during. <laughs> <laughs> Pre, post, during. Pre, post, during. <laughs> Wow. A lot of stiffies involved at the Veil session. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of stiffies. And those are, that was fun. Those are big jumps back then. Nighttime, shitty fire on the last jump. It was so weird. There was fire? Yeah. You would literally go off the lip. And it was just like coming into it. Like the lips were like 15, 20 feet tall and you're just coming. It's just dark and you leave the lip and they just shoot flames <laughs> out right of the deck. Up at and, you? Or <laughs> yeah. They 
you weren't going through them. You were going over, over them, them. But you felt them. Like felt you felt the, the warmth underneath you, and it was just so weird. So I wonder strange. whose idea that was. Somebody at Vale. Let's roast them and let's get some fire involved. This is going to be great. Who doesn't love a little fire? <laughs> True. Everyone likes fire. pyrotechnics. Everyone yeah. likes fire. Good times. <laughs> well, that actually kind of brings us to a guest question. The guest question is sponsored by Solomon Snowboards. Uh, their new website is up and live. If you're looking to get yourself a snowboard, head on over to SolomonSnowboards.com. They got all the new hot gear. And let's get into the guest question. Here we go. From Lucas Magoon. Diesel and Stony Buds. The bomb hole. What's good, everyone? Just want to give a shout to Lane. Wanted to know, how do you feel about not having In-N-Out Burger no longer when you send it to the live free or die state? Also, what is vampire food? <laughs> Was he in a wind tunnel? or? I think he's driving he's to driving. work. Driving to work. Yep. Oh, man. How do I feel about not having In-N-Out Burger? I do love In-N-Out. It is good. We had it two nights ago right before we left. <laughs> One last parting little hoorah. But there are things that will hold me over. But back when Lucas used to come out and visit in Mammoth, like that was kind of our thing. Like pick him up at the airport, go straight to In-N-Out. And every chance we got, like get out done riding. Oh, we got a little while. Like let's drive up to Carson. Like a two and a half hour drive for an In-N-Out burger. Like what the hell else do we have to do? And then vampire food was mushies. Magical mushies. <laughs> <laughs> Who named it vampire food? Lucas. Lucas, of course. You get all fucked up and you just walk around and be like, kts, 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 <laughs> like just being super weird on it. But yeah, that's vampire food. That is awesome, Magical dude. Magical mushies. <laughs> Lucas is the man, dude. And I'm so hyped to see him crushing it with goon gear. It seems like he is. Yeah. One day we'll get him out here. Yeah. He'll, but he'll I never be. heard vampire food. He also, he had a part two that I couldn't put on the soundboard that was uh since you're gonna be on the east coast are you gonna be filming some clips for the goon gear movie he's trying to make a movie yes i tanya hit me up about that a few months ago and if they want to go out and do some stuff i am always down oh they want to go out he's like trying to get me to go out there too oh, and hell yeah tanya's kind of the team manager maybe yeah. she handles biz yeah she's president team manager yeah, president <laughs> <She's> director authority <laughs> the boss i would say social media yeah <laughs> No, they kill it with that. But yeah, hell yeah. I'm so down if they want to do that. I don't know what I'll do, but maybe me and Chris will come out. Fuck it. Hell yeah. Maybe a cab five stiffy. Yes. Possibly. In the streets. Yeah. I'll, maybe I'll get back in yoga and do some stretching before. <laughs> <laughs> so not to hijack this conversation too much and make it about myself, but I'm gonna do that right now. <laughs> nice so, intro to that. I'm I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry about that. But Lane had a gigantic influence on myself and I think Scott Stevens and our whole crew. And I think when I was 17, you picked me up and we drove cross country and filmed and we were just some snot nosed kids. Uh, didn't know what the fuck we were doing. And I just want to take the time to say thank you. And that was incredible. And those were some good times. So <laughs> Hell what, yes. what got him to pick you up? Like what was the scenario here? Are you talking when we went back East with Max? Yeah. So we, uh, was that during Keep Talking? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, the year Chad Oshram did, did uh, Keep Talking. We Max and I wanted to do an East Coast trip. We have been talking with Chris. He was out in Salt Lake hanging out with, like, all the SFK guys doing that. And, uh, yeah, we just kind of wanted to go back east, slide some rails. So we grabbed the VX and loaded up Max's truck and drove over to Salt Lake from Reno. I just moved to Reno that year. We drove over to pick up Chris rallied over i remember it was like freezing cold driving through the midwest we stopped at the iowa 80 truck stop and shot hoops in the little arcade there for a couple hours and just rallied back east and yeah i went and rode butternut for a couple of days session that rail went all over the place like you guys took us to some really good spots that you and scotty knew about and yeah it was eye-opening for me because i had always done the same thing with the same crew at that point and that was the first year I'd filmed with people other than the grenade guys and uh, the people I'd lived with in Mammoth forever. So it was like my first time out with all these guys and doing that. And it was fucking awesome. Just kids doing shit proper and hungry is all. That was the best thing is these guys were hungry as shit. And being around that, it was contagious, like made you want to get after it again. And just seeing all the shit you guys were doing made you want to step up your game. And 
try to keep up and do what you could. And it was fucking fun. And the thing that was beautiful about that, we didn't have a filmer. We would just no, we switch didn't. off filming oh, each you other. you guys were trading. And we were filming yeah. for like a legit movie, just switching off filming for each other. Yeah, we brought the VX. We had a couple lenses for it, the tripod. And yeah, there was some times we just put on the tripod and hit play or hit record. And everyone says. <laughs> I think at one point, Redness came out for like two days and then kind of had it with us and went back. But <laughs> <laughs> we were on the trip for a long time. It was just us taking turns. And somebody would always take an hour and a half off and do their filming and somebody get a trick and they grab the camera and whoever's filming before would grab their shit and try to warm up and get That's after good it. style right there. Do you, remember, fun. do you remember in Denver, first of all, we were shooting with J2, rest in peace. And uh, I remember we were at a school hitting a down rail all night with generator lights till the sun came up and all the school teachers were coming into the school as we were still hitting it. <laughs> remember that? Yeah. Uh, that was the only fucking time I ever did that. It was actually horrible. But. They're coming to school already, and you're still <laughs> there. still there. They're yeah. just like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a miserable moment when you see them coming to work, and you're still there. It is when you look back. When you're in the middle of it, like, that shit was awesome. Yeah, true. Best of times. Best of times. Love that stuff. And yep. then, remember, what about the uh, kink rail in Silverton with J2? Ooh. Movie theater rail. This kid, board slid first try, like, Slid off it a couple of times, and the first time it was like one of those down flat down rails that has the drop in the middle, and went down flat and got bucked, and it was cheese grater stairs, and he got Ooh. bucked out and put his arms down underneath him. Twos or Chris? Chris. Oh. Twos is down at the bottom shooting photos, and he dragged his hands down the stairs, and it was when we were doing the Chronicles of Gnarlia, and filleted his hands wide open. It was, oh, just horrific. Like You got cheese grated. Like and a piece of Parmesan. Ever since then, J two, he would call me. He would say, Palm Springs, <laughs> hey, Palm Springs. How you doing? That's why he called you Palm Springs because yeah. your palms. And then, and then he laced it, FT, yeah. right? Yeah, that was a good rail. That thing was fun as hell. But yeah, the first time I hit it, I jumped on it. I thought we like we were pulling each other into it, and I thought everybody was ready to go. Greg Wheeler is filming at the bottom, and Tuz is shooting photos, and. Grinnies yanks me into the thing, back 50 did it. I was all hyped, and I looked up, and I stopped, and Tuz and Greg are just sitting there with their cameras in their hands. Just Both like, of them. Oh, Both we didn't of hear them you. We're it. like, dude, we've been at the top fucking yelling at you guys for five <laughs> minutes if you're ready. That just means Tuz was talking so much shit down there that yeah. the filmer didn't could even hear anything. <laughs> Typical shit. Yeah, that shit was super fun. Oh, man. Some good times on those fucking trips. Mm-hmm. And another thing people don't know that I think's interesting is your, your dad's music. And the song that was in the grenade video, and, and you want to tell the listeners what that's all about? Yeah, my dad does, it's called junk music. It's all percussion based on homemade and found instruments. So oh. it's like a similar, like people don't, won't know what it is, but they may have seen like Blue Man Group or Stomp, like old Broadway stuff. Like it's very similar to that. And it's, Pretty wild. He's produced a couple of his own albums, like really fun stuff. But yeah, the first two or three Grenade movies were his music for my part. And then the Chronicles, he did the opening song for that. But um, yeah, he's done a bunch of stuff. Like ESPN had like, it was uh, his music was the NBA final song one year on ESPN. Like it's been all over the place. It's been in like a bunch of big video games over the years. Just you never know it until you hear it. And you're like, oh shit, that's what that is. It's uh. Like when you go to New York City and there's some dude just playing music on everything, bucket, buckets yep. and whatever. Yep. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's wild. He just builds all these like crazy sound stations and goes nuts on them. Just yeah. figures out what he can make music on and does this. Yeah, he's done it forever. He's dude, we'll link that in the show notes because that sounds pretty cool. It's super rad. It's really fun. It's cool to watch. He's like, he's done a bunch of different variations of things. Like he's played with like DJs and done like crazy sets with them. He's done like. I don't know, all sorts of different shit. It's pretty I, wild. I never knew that. It's really cool. Yeah, it's fun. It's definitely cool. I was his roadie for a while when I was younger. It's how I'd make a little money in the summertime was cruising around with him and help him set up all this stuff and tear down and because it's huge setups and all like heavy ass. Like he'd fill up his van and just like bottoming out his suspension as he'd go and it was pretty cool. Explain what his setup is because I'm curious. Like what are you talking, buckets and shit? So he'd have these huge frames that would all like thread and like screw down to one another and you get there and you'd pull out these like he actually used snowboard bags because it's what we had a lot of laying around you'd pull out, roll out the board bags open it up and you'd build these frames and then in all these buckets you'd pull out all these 
you'd have like different size brake drums and they'd all be drilled with wire and you'd like all the frames had hooks in them and like everything had its certain place and you'd set everything up and it was, it looked weird. And then he'd run like a stick down something and you're like, holy shit, that's like a full octave of like music. Like it's, he would build everything in plates by ear, but it was, it looked crazy. But once you heard it, it was like real music, real sound. It wasn't like, gimmicky or anything and he fucking wails how did he figure that out just messing around um yeah does he get baked also part two because that seems like a baked operation (laughs) trying to figure that out like i grew up outside woodstock new york like parents had to be hippies when i was younger true (laughs) they're living around woodstock yeah he never told you if he smoked the herb the sweet Uh, leaf no he didn't but i i used to smoke my fair share of way too much weed when i was yeah like late teens early 20s so never said anything bad about it so i just figured he did but yeah he knows. must have <laughs> might not have he might have who knows now before we were on camera you were talking about this uh noah selaznik shirt you're wearing uh yeah. it's for the listeners it's an incredible sim shirt of uh noah doing the front side air mm-hmm. with the hobo yep set up and you're talking about how many times a day or how many times <laughs> a week you wear it I wear this shirt at least three times a week because I have three of them that are in my weekly rotation of T-shirts. So, yeah, always looks like I have a – I just look like I wear the same shit all the time. It's I have a closet full of clothes, and I only wear a couple of things in it. And once a year I donate a ton of stuff just to empty it out. But, yeah, I just wear the same stuff all the time. I just have a bunch of each one. Makes life easy. That way it doesn't wear out fast too, huh, because that's a sick shirt. Thanks. Yeah, it's this one's awesome. This was an event they did at Boreal years ago, shortly after his passing. And it was also his board graphic at one point, right? Yeah. Sick. Yeah. Beauty. God. Now back to the grenade, uh, the grenade shit. I was kind of thinking about that, and it like it seemed like it it rose up, and just as quickly as it rose up, it kind of crashed, came crashing down. Yeah, that was that was tough. Like. Anytime you do business with your friends or family, like you're doing such a gamble of shit getting weird or things going horribly wrong and ruining like friendship. And I've always tried to do my best to be able to separate the two. And I've definitely gotten better at it over the years as I've gotten older and taken on different roles and different jobs and had to do other things outside of that part of snowboarding. But yeah, grenade when it first started, like we were talking earlier, like, People were just getting chunks of the company and it blew up and it's like, you get this, you get this. And I never got into that part with them, but uh, definitely got to the point where Grenade got big enough that a whole bunch of people that had other sponsors, myself included, like we were able to leave certain sponsors and ride for like Fatigue Project when they did their outerwear and they were able to pay us for it. And it was awesome, but it was also like the start of the demise of everything because now all of us that had our own sponsors were now putting so much into this and had so much riding on it that when things started to go south, it imploded just as fast as it originally exploded. And there's so many people, a lot of mouths to feed. There was at that point, it was bigger than just the original crew. At that point, there was people all over the world. They had a full world team, like, tons of ams they had moved to portland and bought so much real estate and they had a shop and a warehouse and they still had everything down in june and mammoth at the same time and it was all right around the same time of the housing crash Mm. in 2006 so all that simultaneous just blew up and went south fast but it happens everything comes to an end what was the biggest takeaway from that as far as learning experience my biggest takeaway was to like we were just saying to try to separate the bullshit that goes on like when you work for somebody or when you're friends with somebody you want to go into business with them like it's easier said than done but you need to have that talk like hey we're gonna do this but we can't let it involve like get involved in our friendship like we need to make sure that stays what it is at all times no matter what like i said easier said than done a lot of people can't figure it out but they were so young too right when they started they were so young and they put some people in places that should not have been there, which were roles that like team manager roles. And it takes a certain type of person to be able to deal with that kind of shit and to be able to like hire and fire people, not just hire people and then just 
when it comes to the fire and just kind of let the check stop coming and everybody put their hands up and be like, oh, I don't know, call him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's, I don't know. It was, <laughs> it got super weird towards the end. It really sucked because it ruined a lot of friendships. Like, we've all started talking again since, well, most of us. There's still really? some people that I haven't spoken to since, yeah, 2005, 2006. But for the most part, we all talk again. And um, I know, like, I sent Slater earlier this summer I ended up randomly I ended up with almost 95% of the tapes from Grenade all the DV tapes and I hit up Jared and told him I had them and they were talking about doing something with them so I sent Jared five six hundred seven hundred plus mini DV tapes 90 minute tapes of everything like, like all the, the OG footage all the mini DV all the transfers like from because we filmed a lot of 16 back then so like all the hard transfers like everything that i had filmed that danny had filmed that jared kurt like wow so much shit like it was a walk down memory lane when i was going through them too because i just had these huge boxes at my house and i was like oh i wonder what's in these and just started like rifling through them it's just like oh that that's gonna be fucked up like, you didn't even know that you had it <laughs> no i knew i had all the tapes but i'd forgotten yeah. what we had filmed because it's been a long time so yeah. Start going through that, and you like you see a tape like it's like Junior Worlds, Italy. I was like, oh shit, there's some bad stuff on this tape, but oh well, we'll see. And like, I'll get a call from Jared once in a while. He's like, did you know you sent me this? I'm like, I had a feeling it was on there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's been uh, and he's it's funny. He actually started um, uh, an Instagram that kind of like all the original guys are on and every once in a while on a transfer. Like he sent me a video last night that was pretty classic. Like really funny stuff like old snowboarding it's just like it's such a cool trip down memory lane because i haven't seen any of those in shit at least 15 years you almost forget longer. shit happens right and then yeah. you see it and you're just rem you remember it and you're so hyped yeah because i was one of those people like i moved when i moved to mammoth i had a dv camera like a mini dv camera that a friend had got me it was like one of those little sony blocks that you pull the lens out and just flip it to on and hit record and i was one of those people i'd go out partying at night and i'd have a pocket full of tapes and i'd pop one in and just hit record and just walk around and then all of a sudden i'd look down and be like oh shit that tape ran out a while ago and i'd pull it out and <laughs> pop a new one in and just hit record so like Half of it's just like filming at the floor, being a drunk idiot. But every once in a while, you catch those little gems. And yeah. I was like, because I one of my favorite groups growing up was Wildcats, and I love their movies because of best snowboarders and their antics, like always partying, always having fun. And it was nothing bad. Like they weren't fucking shit up. Like once in a while, they'd break something, but it was nothing bad. But it was just the shit they would do to each other and around each other and with each other it was always like. Got me so hyped on everything, so I always wanted to like make sure I, if I could catch those little moments on a camera just to be able to relive them later on down life. I wouldn't. Apparently, Jared's been reliving them all for the last like three <laughs> months. I would like to watch some of yeah, those. Yeah, it sounds Personally, like there's some gold in there. Out. I saw Pat Moore posted. He, he did that uh, cab seven to front ten in the half pipe, and you're following him with your camera. And I was like, damn, I want to see Lane's. Was that in Chronicles? Or what that. Was that in? That ended up, do you remember TPS reports? Oh, yeah. When Grenade uh, would do yeah. their, like, video mags? So that was in one of the TPS reports. Um, the first year they did those, I think. That was in there. Well, ba going back to the party footage, let's talk about your uh, TV show debacle with uh, Bozong. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, that's right. You were on that, huh? Mm hmm So, yeah, once again, my buddy G-Man hit me up. Early one season, I think I just turned 21. I was still riding for Nitro at the time. And he was like, hey, you want to come out and do this? Uh, th this company's trying to do a reality TV show. And they're trying to, I think at the time, they were trying to pitch it to HBO. And uh, they just wanted to do it based on snowboarders. And it was in Park City. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. When is it? And he's like, oh, it's in January. I was like, holy shit, that's a few weeks from now. So figured out a way to do it. Packed a bunch of shit in my truck. Drove over and... When the original cast, I, it was like Chanel Sladex, Anne Malin, um, Knox's wife. Uh, I forget the other girl that was involved in it. And then Rob Kingwell, this Japanese writer, Nori Watanabe, who's like one of the Japanese Burton guys, like higher up Burton guys now, I think. Uh, J2 and myself. And I remember driving over, and that summer before, I had spent almost my whole summer with Bozong. Like, we had done, like, Australia tour and a whole bunch of dumb shit together. And I called him 
pulling into Salt Lake and was like, hey, we're coming to do this. Like, let's hang out. And ended up making a room in our closet because he wasn't living anywhere at the time. So he was living in mine and two's closet. <laughs> we had this house on the side of Park City, and they gave us a bunch of money every week just to do the show. They gave us a ton of money to live off every week for like groceries and stuff. And they would literally give us money and we would go down to the taco maker in park city and get a bunch of tacos, go to the store, buy a ton of beer and then buy like eggs, milk and cheese for the chicks and go back to the house. And they we were just such idiots and they would get so pissed. So we eventually, eventually would just take half the money and give it to them and be like, get whatever you guys want. And we oh, would just chicks. go get a bunch of beer because we were idiots. Like, we come back with tacos and beer, and they're like, are you guys serious right now? Like, what are we supposed to eat? We're like, uh. <laughs> tacos? Sorry. <laughs> like, just such idiots. But, yeah, we uh, spent, like, a month on the side of Park City in this little house. Or it wasn't really a little house. It was pretty big. We had twos and I had the closet. He has full DJ set up downstairs. So we just come back and snowboard all day long. Like, we would ride as much as humanly possible, go back to it's been music, and we just had a bunch of Beers and weed and they're yeah. filming everywhere. Yeah, they were, they were yeah filming. we had cameras everywhere. And one of the funny things is they were like, after the first week, they're like, "Hey man, can you not do that in front of the camera?" Because I would just like we weren't smoking in the house, but I'd roll a joint and go outside, and I'd be like, "Yeah, sure." And they're like, "Well, can you do like make like a?" I was like, "I have an idea." So we made this censored box, and it was just a like twelve inch cardboard box that we wrote censored all over, <laughs> and. It just had a tray in it and a bag of weed in it. And, like, Nate started doing it. He'd, like, take it out and he'd, like, take a nug out. And he'd put the bag of weed on top of the censored box. <laughs> just rolling the joint. It was just like, man, that defeats the whole purpose. But, okay. <laughs> they didn't care. No, it never got picked yeah, up. Yeah, I was going to say, it was it never... a waste of money. Yeah, I've looked for it before because I didn't realize it didn't make it. I, I've kept in touch with one of the guys because when we left, I gave him all my... VHS tapes from growing up because they wanted like backstory on everybody and then I never heard from them. So, oh, like, really? This summer I was like, hey man, can I please get those back? Those mean a lot to me. And he sent them back to me and I was like, if you got any of that other footage, send it my way too. Yeah, I'd dude. love to see it someday. But you could put out your own shit with it. It'd probably oh, be classic. Yeah, you could probably put it on YouTube. But it was just, that was a fun time because yeah, like everybody's just like, it's funny because we were there partying a bunch, but nothing bad happened. We weren't really up to it, like no good. Like, yeah, we were drinking and smoking weed, but yeah. we'd snowboard. We were at the mountain at 8.30 every morning, and we'd ride until they'd stop turning the lifts and then go back and get into some sort of trouble. And, like, Sundance went on during it, and I remember Nate going out, and he had a bunch of friends in town, like, took us out or, like, going out at night and twos his little Audi and just mobbing around town, just all the little roundabouts, and it's been, like, 45 minutes driving in circles around the same roundabout <laughs> sideways. <laughs> that Did they film you guys awesome. snowboarding? They tried to. They hired all Hollywood filmers for it, and none mm. of them knew how to ride a snowboard. And so it got to the point where they would just give us a camera and we'd ah. take it out and snowboard all day with it. Because they couldn't get up there and handle it. Yeah, we literally, like, first morning, first run, we all strapped in and took off, and we came back around on the second run, and the guy was 10 feet down the trail, and I was just like, can I take your camera, man? <laughs> you can go back to the house. It's cool. <laughs> and the guy's just eating shit <laughs> yeah. all day, basically. Well, they had, like real legit cameras and we we're like can you guys and they gave us these little like lipstick cameras with like the backpack pouch that you'd like film each other with oh really they literally free gopro to, yeah free gopro but yeah they were it was cool idea very poorly thought out yep. and with the wrong group of people <laughs> i personally would love to see that show come out right now yeah that's what i'm saying in. dude <laughs> it was yeah it was really funny it's like Everybody got along in the house really well. Like, it sounds like it was such a, like, a clash of personalities. And it was, but, like, Kinger is one of the raddest fucking people ever. Like, such a nice guy and just such a diehard snowboarder. And so is Nori. And the girls, like, minus us doing stupid shit like the grocery things, we all got along super well. And we'd all go ride a bunch. And They almost don't want you to get along on yeah, those shows, they're right? looking for drama. <laughs> yeah, they want the drama. And there was, like, yeah, there was... Everybody had their moments. Everybody did some stupid shit while we were there, but, and they wanted us to do more dumb shit. Like at one point, like I think the, yeah, the garage was like this, but they had a bunch of bean bags and a pole in the middle of it. And I was like, what do you, like we're in park city. What do you think is going to happen on that? Oh, really? Yeah. They put like a stripper pole in. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's actually hilarious. A little yeah. kind of bait them. Yeah. It was funny. I think we used it more than, yeah, nobody else used it. Just us drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, well, I think that kind of brings us to a section of the show, buds. You Name know, that video part. Here we go. Let's do it. I had to check, make sure we had the prize back. Oh, nice. I was like, what's what's back there? Oh, so, uh, Name That Video Part is presented by the Dew Tour, as you all know. Uh, you guys should go ahead and check out the event this year. It is a fantastic event. You'll see all kinds of hot action. But, uh, Lane, how are you feeling as far as confidence levels? Uh, not good. Not good. Okay. If it's, I'd say, pre mid 90s late 80s yeah i'll nail it but uh i i did watch a lot of snowboard videos but it has been a little while okay well let's just see how let's see how the kid does <laughs> here we go danny butthole surfers <laughs> Props. Heed me up for that one. <laughs> I tell you, I wanted to, I wanted you to get the prize pack. Even though everyone gets the prize pack nowadays. What we have here, uh, it's an all-over print igloo cooler filled with bombhole merch. All available where, buds? At the uh, bombhole.com. Bombhole.com. Yes. He's got a mug, air freshener, with Stony Bud's face on it. That's what's up. That's The a- goods. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. <laughs> We'll keep our sparklings in this on the drive. Yeah, there you go. That'll come in handy. All right. So for part two, this one's for the listeners. You know the drill. If you know it, comment on the photo of Lane Knack on Instagram for your chance to win what, buds? Price back. Exactly. Let's go. Captain, there are doubts. That is a timeless classic. Lane looks like he knows it. Good stuff. He does look like he knows it, huh? <laughs> you can say it and we'll beep it out. Uh, we'll let the kids find out. Okay. we like to thank you guys for playing a little Name That Video Part. So, so Laser, there's some fun little banter uh, thing we got going here on the bomb hole, and it's about the oldest McTwist. Um, we got a couple people in contention. You got Turier, Chad O, and Richards. Now, who do you think will be the oldest human as far as age to be able to do a McTwist? That's that's such a tough one. And I'm going to say Chad. Only because he is a freak of nature on a snowboard. Kid's a freak. Yeah. Fastest kid alive. <laughs> um, Todd will probably be doing McTwist right up until... He can't, and then Chad will laugh and do one uh, five minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how he still does what he does. and But it's like I rode with Todd this winter, like randomly at Boreal one day. I just went up with my wife. We left the, her and the kid in the lodge, took a couple of runs, and like looked up, and Todd was on the chairlift. And for like five people at the resort, took a run with him, and just watching him snowboard, like he does not skip a beat. He is always been insane will always be insane and same with Hawkin, like the goat like he is in he's unreal and he'll be doing mctwist probably right around the same time as todd and then they'll both not be able to do it and chad will like i said laugh and keep doing him chad's a little younger than those guys though yeah pretty like, sure yeah a couple years maybe like yeah. four or five years younger you're right. right so that might have something to do with but it but it also though the age it's like that gives them Todd an advantage if he's already up five years on, on Chad, you know? Mm-hmm. We'll see. We'll have yeah. to see. Only time will tell. See ya, Chad. So another thing while we're talking about this, uh, I basically said that um, J.P. Walker was the Michael Jordan of snowboarding, and a few people had an absolute conniption fit. You caught some heat for that. Yeah, people, the fact that I didn't say Terrier, a lot of people were uh, throwing some shade at me. Shade you know, was A couple tossed. people agreed. But uh, yeah, who'd you who'd you slot in that position? The Michael Jordan of snowboarding. Oh wow, that for me that would be Todd Richards. Yeah. Okay. Just slightly different generation. Like was Richards one of the dudes who threw shade at you? No, he no. wasn't. Did he comment? Maybe or something? he did. I don't he know. He threw shade at you. I thought maybe he uh, did. Johan from Capita. 
The okay. Apple. Yeah, C C three. Um, I know Johan said Richards chimed in on it at some point. Yeah, there. But the only reason I say that is because like, I look at his career and how long he's been going. But then you see him like he's announcing it every big contest, does the Olympics, all that stuff. Like, he's in the limelight that way. Still, like, JP snowboarding is still out of this world. He'll always be one of the best. He's insane at what he does. He's he's brought so many cool tricks to the forefront of snowboarding that are like standards in today and stuff like that. But like, yeah, Todd is just is more timeless in the sense of he's just still going in the way he's going. And yeah, I think you're gonna catch some shade for that. What do you think, buds? I don't know. I mean, MJ is a heavy, heavy shoes to fill yeah. right there. I don't even know if we've met the MJ of snowboarding yet is what I'm saying. Yeah, that that could be true too. But, yeah, it's – I don't know. I think if you're talking – like when you say Michael Jordan, to me it's like it's more the limelight of things and yeah. the person that's in plain sight more than everybody else. It's like think of – he just had that doc, or that documentary just came out. I forget the name of it. I don't know if you guys watched Last it. Last Dance. Last Dance, and it's about the Bulls, but it's about Michael. Yeah. Hey, Kerb. <laughs> Curveball. Who's the Dennis Rodman of snowboarding? <laughs> the Dennis Rodman of snowboarding? Oh, shit. That's a really... Shane Flood. Shane Flood, all right. Because and the only reason I say it is, dude, he used to snowboard in like a thong and stuff like that. And he was that guy that he was tightest pants off the hill, baggiest pants on the hill. He was such a rocker on the hill, but in his car was just blasting Justin Timberlake. Like, that was Shane. Yeah. Just off the wall. Like, he had, he lived with him and Zimmerman and Clancy, and I forget who else had a house at one point in Mammoth. And Shane had a, he lived in the loft. He had a coffin that we made him. Come on. And I had a door that lifted up, and he would go inside and sleep. And it was probably, like, seven feet long, three feet tall, four feet wide, but it was a fucking coffin. Black. <laughs> Dude slept in a goddamn coffin. And it was just a wood frame that set, or is a, a wood box that was framed that sat on the carpet. So he essentially slept on the carpet with his blankets. But, yeah, it was a coffin. Didn't he always wear the thongs under his snowboard pants, too, or something? <laughs> or under his pants? Yeah. I don't remember yet. Yeah. yeah, he was a character. Good yeah. dude, though. Awesome. Such an all-time human. Yeah. Such a good dude and one of the best snowboard. Like, one of those people that could snowboard on anything and do it just as good switch as he could do it regular. The so. Dennis Rodman. So, Laser had a hell of a career on the snowboard. And then you kind of started phasing out to a little life after boarding park crew at Boreal, correct? Yeah, well, I stopped riding. Well, I never stopped riding. I, like any snowboarder, your contracts eventually dry up. You don't make as, or any money at some point. And you need to figure out what to do next. And I was fortunate enough that when I was snowboarding, and I'd first moved to Mammoth, I had a little condo there that was super inexpensive. Like, when I moved to Mammoth, it was literally half the cost to buy a condo as it was to rent a place. So by the time I left, it had gone up enough. I sold it, made some money, and moved up to Reno and just hung out for a couple of years. And over those first two years, I started going to Kingvale a bunch. I had met Dave Franzen and Jay Red that owned Kingvale and uh, – Help them for a couple of years. I would just go up there and do hand crew a little bit when they needed raking. I'd do their web videos. Like we did a whole bunch of fun stuff there. And then I'd say my money ran out. But when I was done wasting my money because I had no more to waste, um, I called Bridges and was kind of like picking his brain about what I should do next. And he told me to give uh, Boreal a shout. And they were looking for somebody there. And yeah, they were looking for a hand crew supervisor and figured it's. It's kind of similar to what I've been doing. You're just working on features all day, like on the like the day to day operations of it. Not so much building them, just maintaining them. So I gave that a shot, and it was it completely changed my life and started riding more than I ever had because you're at the mountain working on stuff all day every day, and it's just one of those things like you don't know what like so many people like they're like oh I'm done snowboarding I don't know what to do with myself like there's so much stuff people can do you just have to take that step to figure out what it is you're into and be willing to actually do something different. That's actual work and not just like, I'm not saying snowboarding is not work. It's one of the gnarliest things you can do to your body. Just constantly beating the shit out of yourself. But 
it's a different type of work. It's more like routine, more same thing day in and day out, but it's awesome because you're in the mountains, you're still snowboarding every day, like a huge part of your job, like not all hand crews are the same, not all terrain parks are the same, but a huge part of the hand crew at Boyle is like you're constantly, um, they call it testing the features, which is just taking laps and riding. And there's days where you're literally like you ride enough where you're like, oh, I got to rake everything. I just put enough ruts and everything. I want to go make it smooth again. And that just kind of spiraled into what I've done for the last like 12, 13 years now, which was really cool change of pace, but made it so I could still snowboard every day. And then how did that evolve as far as just working on features? So I started, as uh, like I said, just hand crew supervisor, just raking and in spare time and downtime, like in the falls, we do all the rail refurb. And then I taught myself how to weld when I was there. And it got to the point where we were making all the features and uh, it evolved into helping out running snow cats and moving snow around and setting features and building some stuff. And over the years spawned into a decade of just like, we ended up going to super park a couple of times and, we made all the snow, like Boyle's a super small mountain. And you remember Matt Malilla, you met him a couple of times. Yeah. Matt was my boss at Boyle forever and awesome person to work with him. Timmy Hay, like worked with the best crew, Mizzle, um, Kayla Wills, like junior, like there's just this all-star crew of people that made that place what it was. But we essentially just spawned into making our goal is to make fun stuff for people to come have fun on. Like we didn't want to make the biggest features. We didn't want to make, we just want to make the best and funnest features like parks that flowed like skate parks and kind of made our own niche for a place for people to come have fun and enjoy themselves. But it was killer because it taught us everything. Like I said, like we're welding, we were setting features, ripping features out and took over our lives for a long. That's all I did for almost 10 years straight was just work in that park. And that's what my life was about pretty sick sometimes i feel like uh the park crew to, are like the unsung heroes of the snowboarding world like they don't get the fucking cred <laughs> honestly though like these dudes because you know i was a digger at one point and you their camaraderie between the the squad is incredible that's yeah. super fun but then also like you know people just show up to these parks bust and, and don't realize the work that goes behind it and yeah, I think it's a good job for people looking for something to do as well, right? It is, and it's like when you're snowboarding, like art- snowboarding is an artistic expression. Like it is what you make of it. It's what you want it to be. There's nothing set in stone saying it has to be this. And terrain parks are the same. Like everybody looks at a, like you can look at a flat bar in a park and it's like people see a flat bar and it's like, oh, you can have that go up, down, sideways, on a bank training, on a like actual transition training. Like you can put it so many different ways. And that's the fun thing is like everybody we worked with there, all love to snowboard and would just do the craziest shit with every feature we'd make. And then it got to the point where it's like, well, we can't do that with this feature. So we can, we can make stuff like this. And we made so much weird stuff. Like guys in the hand crew would see shit in a video and they'd be like, can we make this next year? We'd be like, yeah, sure. And like make some wild ass features. And yeah, we were just, we had cool, like people that trusted us not to kill people and let us kind of do what we wanted to do. And, make what we wanted to make and set it how we wanted to set it. So we had a lot of freedom there to make the place really fun and kind of have it ride how we wanted it to ride. And kids would come ride it and love it. I feel like at Super Park, the crews, diggers and, and builders get, get a head nod, you know, get respected. And It is, but it's because it's more in the limelight because Snowboard is doing it and yeah. puts so much emphasis on that at that event. But when you're just at the mountain, it's like, a different scenario, huh? Well, it's like you, if you're just one of those people, you go every couple of days. Every time you show up, the mountain's groomed. It's like, ooh, the mountain's groomed again. It's like you don't realize that there's crew working two shifts because a place like Boyle, it's open till 9 at night. There's a swing shift that goes out, grooms the backside of the mountain. They end around midnight. There's another crew that comes in at midnight, does the grave shift. They do all the park stuff. The park crew rakes constantly throughout the day. They close it down at night to make sure it sets up all night. The groomers groom around all the rake lines, and they come in in the morning, make sure everything the groomers did is right, and then repeat. But it's it's a lot of work. It's it's definitely a ton of effort, but it's super fun. Like if you're willing to put in the effort, it's one of those it's one of those things that people can get into, like life after snowboarding kind of shit, where it's not like a a team manager or a marketing director or working in a warehouse at a company that you rode for or something like that. Like it's it's a way to actually, like, I'm not kidding. I snowboarded so much more 
when I started working at a ski resort than I did when I was snowboarding. And I was one of those kids that would snowboard almost every day. It really? just got to the point where I would snowboard every day because I was working every day. Yeah, so you were just there. Mm-hmm. That's pretty chill. And yep. then, then you picked up split boarding too, right? Then I picked up split boarding because once in a while it was nice to get away from the mountain. <laughs> and that was like the year I picked up split boarding, I actually lived in a condo on the side of the snowmaking pond at Boreal. So I would just days or even not on days off, like I'd go out at like four in the morning and just skin up Andesite Peak, which is across the street from Boreal. And by the time the sun was coming up, just clip everything back together and rip back down and then cross the highway back and go to work for the day. But it was one of those things like it was at my doorstep and it over the last couple of years when I stopped working at Boreal and got over to Diamond Peak and started doing a different aspect of resort operations, I would days off. I was like, I don't even want to be at the mountain anymore. I would just kind of go split board over on Mount Rose and just get lost and go explore and check the place out. And it's, it's fun. It's more freedom and it's hippie as shit, but it's super fun. Just another aspect of snowboarding. Well, now I have a question. We were talking earlier about fits, right? I'm rocking the sleeveless hoodie. You're saying the appropriate is two to maybe three hoodies, uh, depending as far as uh, the correct outfit. Now, when you're split boarding, are you wearing Gore-Tex or are you wearing hoodies is what I'm wondering. Sweatshirts. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put some respect on that. I will. If it's just beyond nuking, I'll wear a jacket. But typically, like, even if I do wear a jacket, when I get up to the top, I'll take it off and just ride back down normal. But it's, I don't know. My pants are still as baggy as they've always been. And <laughs> not a lot's now, changed. Hypothetically, Gore-Tex comes to you and they're like, hey, I'm Jim from Gore-Tex. I'd like to sponsor you. Now, are you so tied to the hoodie that you're going to be like, fuck no? Or are you, what are you saying? Do you wear a sweatshirt that says Gore-Tex on it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thinking they could develop a special sweatshirt. Okay. A cut off put their logo on a hoodie. Or a hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> Easy style. <laughs> Not a great advertisement Spray for, their, scotch for their product, I don't think. Spray with Scotch Guard. It's good to go. Have you ever tried out Gore-Tex? Because it kind of changes your life from cotton blends. Yeah. 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 Big cotton guy. I had just, some. I've had some good clothes over the last couple of years. Like some friends gave me some stuff that was really, really good. But it's just all go at the back same time. To that hoodie. It's, well, it's, I don't know. Certain occasions, like when I went, we went to Japan years ago, and I definitely wore a jacket. Super wet. Half the time I was there, just because it's it really was strange. so wet. It's actually really fucking strange when you see Lane when in you a see him in a jacket. It's you're almost just like, like seeing like an albino fucking elephant or something. Like, <laughs> what the hell is going on right now? <laughs> I don't know who this person is. Yeah, like, who is that? <laughs> That's awesome. Once in a while, the occasion calls for it. It's You'll like do wearing it. a suit or something like yeah. that. Once in a while, you have to. <laughs> it's like wearing a suit. <laughs> hey, you uh, talked about uh, Kingvale, and I got a Patreon question from Scotty Connolly. Remember him, Scotty yeah, the Body? the body. Uh, he says, Lane, my man. Hey, it's your old friend Scotty Connolly from Mount Hood. You guys were absolutely killing it with Kingvale, and it was really starting to take hold to become a sex successful resort. Just wanted to see what happened there, and if there's ever been an attempt to start it up again. Oh, what happened there? So when I was at Kingvale, like I just helped out what I could, so I wasn't involved behind the scenes. But I do know that they had, um, they didn't own the property; they had leased the property mm-hmm. in Kingvale. For those people that don't know, it's just a tubing hill, a little hill on the side of I-80, literally, like, you can spit from the bottom of the mighty toe and hit the highway. But uh, just, like, two exits after Boreal going towards Sacramento on the 80. But it was, a, it was a really small place. I think the previous, or the guy that owned the land didn't think it was that worth much, didn't think it'd be successful. And those guys, Jay and Day, worked so hard. It was a tubing lane on the weekends, and as soon as the weekend was over, they'd plow all the snow around pull all the features up, build a park Sunday night, Monday through Friday. It was a terrain park. And then as soon as Friday would hit, they'd rip everything out, wind row a couple lanes back up. Um, they put the chairlift or the handle toe in, the mighty toe. Um, it was their cats. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm pretty sure after that first, like it wasn't open to the public for two years. It was just private. We just did shoots and filmed a bunch of stuff there. It was super fun. And then the first two years it was open to the public. They weren't getting rich off of it, but it was able to sustain themselves amongst some other things. And I'm 
pretty sure when their lease was up, the guy thought they were making a ton of money, so he just jacked the lease up astronomical. And at that point, they were like, because there was a bunch of people involved in the ownership of it, and once you're talking that little bit of profit split between that many people and then the price is going up that much, they just couldn't do it anymore. The guy and, ruined it, huh? Yeah, it did, and Jay went on to um, work at Piston Bully. He was one of the guys that designed that park row that's been at Super Park every year. Ah. Um, and he was, like, one of the main guys at the Reno office, and Day went on to be the park manager over at Mount Snow. Like, he built out – he was one of the people behind, like, the Corinthia revamp a oh, really? bunch of years ago. He's, yeah. That's Jay's, pretty cool. So yeah. those guys went on to do good things. Yeah, and now Jay is the operations manager at Diamond Peak and Incline and Day up until this last year was the ops manager at uh, Donner Ski Ranch. Oh, wow. So they're both mountain managers at Resorts in Tahoe again. That sucks that one guy just had to ruin it because dollar signs in the eyes. It is, but it's what happens when you have something and you don't think it's worth anything and somebody makes something of it yeah. and you want more. And the leasing is the problem, huh? It is, yeah. Like, if they had bought that, it would have been a different it would be on. story. But it's like the lease, like, they have a lot of land right there. Like, that little area that you saw that people felt, like, the little terrain park was literally, like, ten, eight or ten acres of, like, want to say 186 acres in total wow it spawned like and it's super short so it was just a really wide area and they had all these other areas that they were going to build like we went one summer and pulled a a t-bar mm -hmm. off of homewood resort and brought it over to kingvale and they were going to put it in they ended up selling that that's what it's at uh, area 241 mike bass oh, really place. he that took was, it that was a t-bar from uh, a different resort that they eventually wanted to put in but they never were able to get in Wow, that's cool. Good for Mikey. Yeah, so that ended up going to a good home, but like they had so much room to play with there, and we would do so much cool shit all over the place, and literally would like anywhere you wanted, like you go out in the like side country there because you're not really that high up in the mountains, and you'd find a rock, and you're like, oh man, be fun. There's a lip. Day would literally or Jay would they push some snow up, backblade it, drop a till, and then if you couldn't not get enough speed, they'd start stacking snow with the cat and, and just make it fully. <laughs> Groom it all out, till it all out nice, and just make it so that everything was perfect. Well, that's the cool. landing would get bombed out. They'd get in there and they'd pull the snow out and till it out, and make it a nice hard pack landing at that point. But it was like they would just do so much fun stuff there. That place was the ultimate playground. Yeah, that sounds like cool. the dream that everybody has. It's like what you have with the Freedom Frontier. It's like well, on steroids. Well, yeah, but it's like your own thing, full DIY. Like those guys made all their own features and. The rails there, it was like their testing facility. If you bought rails from, uh, it was called railbuilders.com. Like they did, uh, if you bought rails from any of the, like the the resort manufacturing companies, like Fall Line, it was their rails. And they would just build them there and test them there. And then they'd just mass produce them and send them to other resorts. So it was pretty cool. That sounds cool. Now back to the fabrication of uh, steel and stuff like that. You kind of evolved your snowboarding terrain park manager to building rails to eventually starting your own business right yes and that's what we're actually driving across country for right now well a bunch of reasons but one of them is uh we started hfm welding this last year and kind of just want to do that for for a long time and just be my own boss and do my own thing and i love like i know you do like burning metal and making shit out of metal so be a a cool change of pace, do something different, be my own boss, and just make awesome stuff for whoever wants whatever they want. Kind of you dream it, I'll make it. Do you ever find that welding being therapeutic at times, just being in the zone? It is. The buzz, the smell of molten metal. <laughs> There's a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff I love about it. It's the shit. It's well, a damn good time. Sometimes when you're just focused on dragging the bead, and you're just, that's all you got going on, and like sometimes you get this weird zen going. It sounds weird, but I've I've experienced that. For sure. It is explain it, dragging the bead to the layman. Let Lane explain it. <laughs> so when when you're MIG welding, like Chris has set up over here, you essentially are creating a pull of molten metal, a puddle of molten metal, and then you're just dragging it back and forth and creating the bead, which is the weld laid out at the end of the time that you're dragging it back and forth. There's, like, a bunch of different ways of going about it, but essentially, like, you're pulling the trigger, creating an arc, and you're making something the size of your fingernail and just manipulating it back and forth, 
down or up or sideways, whichever way you want to go with it. Like there's all different styles and forms and types of welding and ways to weld, but the main one, MIG welding, that's pretty much what you're doing. You guys are both self-taught. That's it's interesting tight. when you go around, everybody's got their own little different techniques of how they clamp stuff or how they do things or, uh, you know, there's... When, when you guys say self-taught, are we talking you looked on the web and watched YouTube vids or you just got in there and did this? I figured it out trial and error because it wasn't a lot of YouTube when I started or there might have been, but I didn't know yeah. shit about YouTube for the longest time. More recently, the last like seven, eight years, I've yeah. gotten more into it. Yeah, Same at first, <laughs> I was one of the, the late the latecomers to the YouTube game of learning shit off of it. What about you? Uh, it's not about me. It's about Lane anyway. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so what I was wondering too is now you got your bi- your business and you're going you're going cross country with the metal fabrication company, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. We have a uh, a lot of that's what I was saying. Like on that trailer, it's a lot of tools, and it's fun. We ship my wife's car, and if you open up the back of the car, there's like plasma cutter. ACDC TIG welder, multi-purpose, like, MIG welder, stick welder, DC TIG welder. Like, the whole back of her Jeep is literally just, like, welders lined up across the back of it. You got that many different welders. Well, one of them's a multi-process, so it does three different types of welding. And then one of them is, it's it's technically not a multi-process, but it'll still do, like, stick welding and then two different types of TIG welding. And then plasma torch, which is the fun one. What's the plasma torch? Cuts just through metal. metal. Cuts through metal? <laughs> yeah. What are you planning on fabricating with your business? Um, anything? Anything. Like, I spent a little while and went to school for, like, structural welding and pipe fitting just to, like, learn and get a bunch of practice with that and then dropped out because it was a complete shit show of a joke of a school. Really? Just huge waste of money. But I did get a lot of time in stick welding and pipe fitting and doing a lot of structural. And, like, I just had a booth and unlimited metal and welders to practice with so it was cool to learn all that stuff but i'm more of a fan of ornamental welding and like i love making signs and furniture and just all that kind of stuff like more artistic form of welding but i will like what i'm doing is a mobile welding business and i will have a shop too so kind of if you need something like farm equipment fixed or anything like that like i get whatever certs i need to get and then just go nuts from there that's awesome sounds like a good biz should be fun. Also, in new Lane Knack news, you're a dad. Yes, I am a dad. I have a 14-month-old little lady, Rosie. She is the shit. She is wild as all hell. Big kid, but super fun. Uh, I got a Patreon question about your daughter, actually, or along the lines of this conversation. Oh. This is from uh, Nanook the Great. And he says, hey, Lane, I was chatting with your beautiful wife, Allie, and she was curious if your daughter, Rosie, could only see one of your video parts, what would you want her to see and why? More importantly, I think we both want to know how you are going to respond if she asked, Daddy, why do you have so many strippers on your boards? (laughs) (laughs) That's a great question. Good question, Nanook. Oh, that is funny. Um, one video part would be, I don't know, it's probably the one that nobody people have seen the least of, and it's from uh, Big Trouble and Little Trucky. That's a great name for a movie, too. Yeah, that was a really fun one. It was like the last video that I did with some friends. It was the like, last King Vale video we did, but we uh, we actually went to Chinatown in San Francisco to film all the skits from it. So oh, it really? Good. Is it on YouTube? <laughs> Uh, it might be. I have a copy of the DVD somewhere. I'll send it to you when I find it when I get back home. But um, it's, to me, it was like, it was all local. It was all Reno and Tahoe. Like, we didn't travel anywhere for it. So it was like, it was a good winter. So we weren't like scraping. Like, we were able to hit a bunch of really cool rails in Reno that we'd always wanted to hit, never had a chance to. And like, the only time I got to hit any of these rails. And then it had, it was just probably my most like well-rounded of all my video parts. Like, cause they were always like either one or the other. It wasn't like a bunch of everything. So it was like the one year I actually got to ride a lot of everything as for strippers on my board. Uh, I thought strippers were pretty unique when I moved to <laughs> Reno and was spent some time at the strip club and my buddy unique. Andy painted that. <laughs> yeah. I had a, a friend, a really good friend of mine, Andy Hollage, that's a really amazing artist. He drew my one smoking graphic out of felt tip pens, but it was literally like 
he pretty much wrote the alphabet out in strippers and then oh, wrote a smoking gra- like put a smoking graphic together with it. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Unique actually sounds like a stripper name. Unique on stage one. <laughs> You'd be a great stripper <laughs> announcer, bud. You would. You got that voice. A hey, bomb hole tanks, dude. You head straight over to the straight strip club. Straight to the to titty or strip club and uh, get on the. You have to be a DJ too, I guess. But I could. You well, got that. I can figure that play out. Play some Rasta hits. Yeah, play I'm down. No, down. you got to play those. I mean, they put out stripper songs now. Basically, there's. And we passed the sign for one coming in on the eighty. It was just like, oh gosh, that's got to be awkward in Salt Lake. Was it? In Trip Salt Hotel. Lake or the one in Green or in uh, Nevada, because no, it was like twenty board. miles outside of the Salt city. Lake's got some laws. It's like Salt going Lake to a beach. It's basically like the worst strip club town in America. Yeah, Salt Lake. They got they have uh, they have to wear nipple covers, pasties, pasties. pasties. Yeah, and it's so it's basically like going to a beach. But then if you go if you go all nude, it's no alcohol. It's no, no alcohol. alcohol, which is weird. Yeah, if it's right. It's 18 and up and no alcohol. So it's like <laughs> so weird. Crazy rules. I don't, I haven't even at this point like I haven't been to one in so long at this point but and I'm like yeah that was at one point in my life I did a bunch of that but it's like especially not like have a little girl and Yeah. But yeah, even years before that like it's been a it's been quite some time. Quite some time. What about you mentioned smoking? You actually went and handmade some boards for them too, right? I worked there for a while. Um and that was like the first couple of years I was at Boreal and the year before I was there, I worked at smoking and just cause it was back then it was a super small operation. I think when I started there, he made like or sold 450 boards a year and that pretty much included his samples for the next year. So it was just a couple of us, like my buddy Chris Hatt and I would go in there and just make boards. And then um, we do that for a few months and then winter would start and we go snowboard. And then the next year, like kind of grew a little bit more. And then it got to the point where, the manufacturing season went from like three months to almost like six, seven months. And I was working at Boreal full time and they'd make us take up like six weeks off each year. So like I'd get my vacation from Boreal and I would just go make snowboards nonstop, like 12 hours a day, every day. Wow. And then I got to the point where I wasn't even getting time off from Boreal anymore. So I had to stop doing it. But yeah, yeah. I spent like six or seven years making snowboards every summer. So did you make your own boards? I did. It had to have been a pretty rad thing. Cool process, learning all that. It was super fun because when we got to the point where Jay gave me my own board, I, at that point I was like such a nerd about shit. And I tried so many different materials and so many different of his like, we do different things to cores and like the process of actually like curing the boards. Like we tried so much different crap and it was fun to actually like nitpick and make my board what I wanted it to be and how I wanted it to be. And it's, Describe describe what that is. Yeah, there's a lot of board nerds yeah. out there. Yeah, they love are, hearing board yeah, talk. They, like, they love, love to hear the, the tech. Well, at first it was like the weird shit because it was this is like pre reverse camber, pre flat camber, and we were trying to find ways like because when I first started making the boards, like the big snowboarder for smoking was Andrew Brewer. Mm, Brewer, and it was like right when he was starting to come up and like win contests and like start filming and shit like that. And he wanted a flat snowboard, and we were like, oh, we don't have a flat press so we would like his jay's presses have heat pads on top and bottom of the cassettes that pushes like applies all the pressure onto the board in the mold so we would only turn like one of the heat pads on so we would get it to like our thought processes was if we only turned the bottom heat pad on and didn't turn the top one on yeah it would eventually like activate and cure the glue on top of the board but it would happen first on the bottom of the board so the second we take it out We'd put it down on the ground and put a weight on it. To flatten it. To flatten it as it cured. Wow. And we got it to work a couple of times. But, like, over the years, it was, like, more just messing with different materials of, like, oh, should we add, like, a layer of fiberglass here where the boards are more vulnerable to break, like, above and below your bindings where they typically snap and make it so the boards are a little bit heavier there. And then once we did that, it's like, oh, this board's too heavy. Let's mill it down and make it thinner and softer and then stiffen it with more fiberglass. Oh, let's do, like, a fiberglass with an extra weave in it right here so it doesn't break at this angle like so many different weird things went over went on over the years and now his boards have all come to where they're at like they're great but i ride a traditional snowboard like regular camber regular side cut no magnet traction none of the gimmicks like two layers of fiberglass like i've gone back to the point of like 
how my snowboard was when I was a little kid. Less is more, basically. Less is more simple, light. Like, I ride a really wide board, and it's only 57, but it's super soft board, so the width actually gives it a little bit more stability to it. And I've been riding the same board for literally, like, 10 years now. That's interesting. After all the board making, you went full circle. Mm -hmm. Tell me, everyone puts these stringers on in the boards. Do those do anything? Like carbon stringers and like V shapes to affect the flex and it. I forget Jay's theory to it. He started doing that after I was done, and he calls it pop gnarly. That's yeah. Everyone does, names their shit. He does hemp strings in it, ah, and it has go. something some to do with like there. torsional strength above and below your bindings. I don't know what it has to do yeah. with it. I never really got into that with him. Like that was after I had left there, and every time he'd be like, "You want me to put this in your board?" I'm like. Regular snowboard, Regular please. snowboard. I just feel like one snowboard company makes some shit, and then everyone's like, oh, my God, we got to have that. Well, yeah, and for the longest time, that was always GNU. They'd always make boards with, like, magnet traction or yeah. banana. Like, they did so much different stuff early on, and the boards were all, like, everyone always be like, well, those guys are riding that. Like, those are really good boards. Let's try that. And a lot of companies have all realized, like, it goes full circle, and everybody eventually, like, they're just – it's just a niche in the market where everyone's always going to want the original. Like people are always going to want a regular, like regular side cut, regular camber. And some people like magnet traction is super fun. Like if you've ever ridden one of those, what does boards, it do? I've never actually ridden one. You hold an edge, so it's essentially it like that a, much better a than a deep, blade. Deep, deep side cut. It's really good on hard pack. Okay, really good on hard pack, like icy terrain. Like it literally, it applies. It's not just a constant pressure on one area. It's a bunch of little pinpoints of pressure that you can force more weight and drive into. It's and it's one of those things, like, I personally think you can ride this just as good with all that stuff as you can without it. I'm like, on yeah. the same. Yeah, it's... I'm the same, too. To I each feel their like own, though. The classic that's, is the, the way to go, classic style. It is. And like I said before, like snowboarding is what you make of it. Like if you want to nitpick your setup and make it a certain way, like awesome. If you want to ride whatever you want, awesome. I just need to have wings on my bindings and I'll ride whatever. I don't care, but I prefer to have regular side cut snowboard, regular camber. So the wings. Th that brings us to a guest question from Big Dog, Pat Moore. The Big Dog. Uh, and this guest question is presented by Solomon Snowboards once again. Bomb hole buzzards. This is Pat Moore. <laughs> Lane, hyped you're on the show. Love you, dude. Big fan. I have a couple questions for you. Uh, first one, what's up with the winged highbacks? I know you ran those all the time in the past. Just seeing if you're still running them and what's the deal with them. Uh, second question, if it's going to be like a frozen January day, maybe it's dumping snow, uh, how many hoodies are you running on that type of condition? <laughs> Great questions. Um, yes, I still ride wings. I got my first pair in, I think, 99. It was like Burton Mission GTs came with like an option where you can like pop this little strap out and bolt these wings on. And ever since, have to have them. Explain, sorry to interrupt. Explain what wings are to the people that don't know. So wings are a hook. It's like a half cup on top of your high back that kind of loops around your boot a little bit in front and behind your front and back leg. People do them where they're like U-shaped, so it's on both inside and outside of your leg. But typically, it's just top of your high back, and it's just like a small cup. Like your high back's right here. It just loops around the front of your boot. And the theory You just run the outside, right? Yeah. Okay, continue. And the theory behind it was when you're initiating a turn, it comes from your hips, and you start driving your hips into your turn. And before it goes to your leg, it rolls your knee pushes out your high back and applies more pressure under your heel edge, which is always people's weaker turn than your toe edge. And cool. I understand that. But at this point in my life, it's a necessity and it's in my head and I can't get rid of it. So like I said, it's the one thing I have to have. And I rode, I dragged those wings with me forever. Like every pair of binding I had for the next, like I'd bent metals after that and I drilled holes in the high backs and bolted my wings on and all sorts of different ones. And then, Recently, I had a friend that works for that fixed binding company, my buddy Jake Pollock, and he was like, oh, we have a really good wing binding. You want a set? And he got me a couple of pairs of them, and they're insane and so much fun. And it's like a – they're kind of hit or miss depending on how people do them. So it's like I've had pairs. I'm like, oh, it's all right. But it's like 
these feel like the original ones again, so it's back in my head. Burton doesn't make them anymore? I know they did for a long time. I know they like they came and went. They'd put them out on some of their higher-end bindings because yeah. they were more expensive, and I'm not sure if they still have them or not. Like there was a couple years like Moran when he was their team manager would send me a couple pairs of them each year and I was super hyped. Like, he knew I've, you were down. Yeah, I was like, yes, new bindings. <laughs> Chris, you ever try them? I've never fucked the wings. They're no. kind of sick. Tech they're, Nine they're... used to make them, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I've had I multiple mean, pairs of those. Schooner and Bradshaw, they feel the same as him. Yeah. I mean, they're like they definitely give you some like more response almost. It's it is. It's like less movement. It less is more almost with them mm-hmm. because it's just the way it. I don't know. You have to try them. It is. It's like see it to believe it kind of yeah. shit. And they're like, like I said, like it could be in my head. I don't know. But all I know is I love them. I ride better with them, I think. And I've had them forever. So at this point, like I've. That's your shit. Yeah. I'm not getting rid of them. But yeah. Like I had, I've had pretty much every binding company that's made them. I've used them except for agency. I never use those. I don't even know if I've heard of agency. Bands binding company. Oh. Uh. Back in the day, Danny did like a half ass wing on his binding. Uh, it was like a half a wing. I remember just being it like, didn't even work. What the hell is that, dude? He's like, well, it's a wing, kind of. What about but when they make the suit t- wings that are so soft, they don't even do anything? I felt a couple of those. Those are weird. Like, I had one pair a bunch of years ago where you could literally twist the high back in half. Yeah. And I was like, well, it kind of defeats, kind of defeats the, the whole purpose. purpose. Yeah. yeah. Like, you don't want it super stiff, but you want it stiff enough that it'll actually apply that pressure where it's supposed to. Yeah. It's interesting. And it's uh, and you can if you mess with it, like I said, like it could be in my head, but I can definitely like just turning around the mountain, like you can turn a certain way. Like if you're turning the way you're supposed to on your heel edge, like you can feel it hitting. Yeah, I harder. think you can feel it. Probably gonna be some people trying to cop some wings. Yeah, up they should they definitely. It's worth trying, man. But, uh, you know what? I remembered as we were talking. Fuck, we were he didn't the, answer the hoodie question. He kind of oh. covered it earlier. Well, I guess he covered it earlier. As many as I have to to stay warm. Okay. I'm. What's the people. most you've ever worn? I've never worn more than three and a half. Okay. Three and a half being what me and Buds are wearing. Yes, with this, no is, this is the half. This is the half. So for, <laughs> I got to say, it feels great. No, I think I might start rocking the sleeveless too, on this the This might legs. be a new look right here for us. But, um, dude, I, ha- I just remembered fucking Farmer Snowboards. Holy shit. What, did you ride for Farmer Snowboards? Yeah. Did you hang with Sean Farmer? That was after, yeah. after Nitro, right? Yeah. That was when we were living at that house in Park City, like halfway through being there. Farmer gave me my own. It was like my first pro model. And I met Sean through Rocket. Oh, damn. And that makes sense. He used to like, it was weird. Like, cause I grew up in, like I started snowboarding in 87, 88. So of course, like, yeah. Critical condition. All those movies, like Farmer was my God. Yeah. He was like, insane. He used to come down and come stay with us in Mammoth years ago and, wake up and like walk out of my living room and farmer sleeping on the couch, just be like, what the fuck is going on right now? Like this is <laughs> insane. And then him and rocket and G man wanted to start a snowboard company together. And it was farmer. And they asked me if I'd do it. And I just like no hesitation, like such a dumbass. Like I had such a good thing going with nitro. Uh, like, Tanino was the shit. And just me being me, I was like, this is fucking too cool. Like you can't pass this shit up. Yeah. So I jumped on it and yeah, they let me design my own board and, they were awesome, and they never made it to production. No, it never made it to production. <laughs> no, they put so much. They they blew a bunch of money. Like they did the typical, like, oh, we're gonna go to Vegas and we're gonna do this and that. And by the time production came around, like they had spent so much money, they couldn't do it. It like I think it was Rocket's father in law that was the money behind it, and I think he was just like, I'm I'm done putting money. Yeah, this shit. like guys, this is it, man. Yeah, so I still have like my original sample, and then the original like production of what it was supposed to be but they're just like edges ripped out and beat to hell and back is yeah only two boards i had all year you remember when farmer were you at the super park where he did his rap song oh hell yeah that was so sick yes (laughs) that was like for childhood eastone i was just like damn this is the best moment ever it was sick he came down for grenade games one year and when it was in june and they still had the the shop in june lake and he did a full rap. Oh, I remember Scotty I Arnold. Some, yeah, I saw that. In the grenade video. So classic. That it was, was so sick. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it was in yeah, yeah. Scotty's part, but it was no joke. Like, those two went on for so fucking long. I just remember sitting there like, this is, like, how are we watching this right now? Like, no <laughs> way in hell. I remember watching this when I was, like, nine, ten years old yeah. watching this over shit. Over and over. VHS, like, holy crap. Yeah, yeah VHS, exactly, huh? Hell yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, Buds is known to bust out a freestyle. Did you... Ever you seen Critical Condition, right? I have not. No. God damn! Holy shit! Core, core, 
YouTube. Old head cred going down. <laughs> dude, it's old a head the rolling score. Over. <laughs> it's a hell of a movie, dude. You should watch it. It is. Like, all yeah. those old movies are so fucking good. I'll, I'll have to give it a view. I'm pretty sure they're all... If, if they're it's not worth a view. YouTube, it's on YouTube. I have a VHS that I got from Ross Powers when I was little. That's like, all the snowboard videos from, like... I think 86 to 92. All of them on all one. All burned onto one VHS tape that's like a couple hours long, and you just put it on. Dude, you know Stevens has it. a VHS at his crib, man. He's. Oh, yeah. He knows all this. Yeah, yeah. he's obsessed. He's, he's obsessed. So he does, good about that he shit. He does the research. Fuck, yeah. That's that's awesome. <laughs> you got it, though. Like, I don't know. To me, like, we talked about this. Like, I always loved snowboarding. Like, to me, it was like the cold. Like, snowboarding is always the funnest activity in the world to me. I always loved it so much, but. What really got me was, like, the culture behind it. And, like, I laughed when I walked in and saw that snowboarder with Russell on the cover. Like, I remember being a little kid and hiking the pipe at Stratton. I was, like, eight, nine years dude, what, old. And what year? I, I was probably there, dude. <laughs> like, at this point, it was, like, 90, 91. Yeah, I was definitely Seemed there. Like him and, and like, he was ripping. those guys and, like, his Mistral Sweet. board. Yeah, his yeah. Mistral board. Watching all those guys, like. Seth Mill, and Seth. Yeah, and Neary and Miller and. All those guys, Doug Burns, like Burnsy. Dude, we were there at so the same good. pipe, I'm sure, and we just you were super young and I was a little <laughs> bit older. Yeah, I just had my little Burton Cruise that was like a foot and a half taller than me. Dude, hiking. The, and the pipe was <laughs> sick. So small good. and dope. Small and I'm trying to get a back. petition to just get the small pipes at every resort now. Bring back the shovel. Yeah. Austin <laughs> Sweeten posted something about that the other day, like and I was just like, we did. He, it's just about how fun they are, and people would enjoy pipes more, I think, if they weren't. Dude, it's it's so sick, and like I keep talking about the place, but like at Boreal, towards the end of being there, they do that Tom Sims retro contest. Oh yeah, and it was always like they that was do, a hand dug one, right? They would, but the last couple of years we did it, especially the last year, like the year before we were at Super Park, and the crew did it without us. But uh, we would literally go in and like just blade stack the wall. And they would go in and back drag one half because once the other wall was in, you couldn't get the cat down the middle. Uh, and they'd blade stack the other wall, and we'd go in and just kind of half ass smooth it. And we built hips into it, and you just jump into it and carve the walls. And wherever you carved, we would just put tombstones on top and dig highways in. Oh, that's so. And it sick. got to the point where you could like hip air into this bank landing, and then just highway into highway, and it was on a flat area. So by the time you got to the last one, you're doing like a hand plant because you had no speed. Yeah. Which was like a typical half pipe back Yeah, then. exactly. But that shit like just brought back so many good memories of being a little kid and riding that shit. Like, and you can blast out of those little highways. Yeah, those like, highways, so man. so fun. It's just, it is one of those things. Like, if you haven't ridden it and you're all about perfect half pipes, go ride a shitty little half pipe. It is as fun as it gets. Yeah, you'll love it. Lip tricks for days <laughs> and just dumb shit like that. It's just, I don't know. It's brings back like those memories of being a little kid and just, Going to the half pipe at eight in the morning and then ski patrol peeling me off of it at four thirty. Yeah, exactly. You got to go back to your parents, kid. Yeah, when they come sweep the pipe at yeah. the end of the day, just like everyone out of here. Yeah, like Mount Sn- or not Mount Snow, uh, Magic Mountain. Magic. Yeah. yeah, I used to go to Bromley Magic, all that stuff. Bromley is heard the Bromley, shit. and are they still around? Yeah, I just haven't been back to Vermont in a while. They have one. I forget who does it, but they hired a. They contracted uh, one of the bigger companies to come in and build their park this last year. Oh, really? So, like, trying so to they get got back a good on. Pipe. Yeah. Sick. I got to get back that east. That place is fun as shit. My dad, my parents' house was, like, seven or eight minutes from there growing up. Really? So, like, after high school, if I really wanted to go ride, my dad would be like, all right, get in the car. You got, like, an hour. Yeah, he'd just go wait around. <laughs> yeah. Super fun. So dope. Yeah. It's a good time back there. All right, laser. Well, we've been doing it, man. Wait, one quick last question here, maybe. Uh, why laser? Where'd that come from? Shit, that's a. Do you even remember? I, I don't think know. that was Ricky Tucker. Ricky Tucker. Yeah. Just laser lane sounded good. Well, we were just idiots, and I'd always be making like weird noises, and he just started calling me laser one day, and because it's a cool nickname. It's stuck. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> great, it's a great it. nickname. It's a great nickname. <laughs> uh, I feel like Bridges always runs it still too. He does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's stuck like I have a like a core group of friends that that's what they refer to me as. So yeah. It's so it's such a good one. <laughs> Hell so, yeah. And then so what what's next? What's <coughs> next on the docket? Back east. Uh I want to see you in this goon gear vid video. That's yeah, that's my main thing is do what I can and just enjoy my life with my family and 
spend as much time with my friends as I can and work as hard as I can and just enjoy myself and make sure like that's what I'm doing. Like too many years of doing everything for a company or something like that and just work, work, work with it's not no reward, but it's like at the end of the day, it's like, what are you doing it for? Are you super happy? Like I've been fl- like so beyond grateful to snowboard for as long as I did meet the people that I was able to meet, have the friends I'm able to have still to this day. And then transition into parks and the friends I got out of that, like so many good friends. And I'm so beyond thankful for that, but I'm just ready for that next phase to be able to like spend more time with my family and, be able to snowboard and still go see everybody. Like hopefully come here and see you guys go to Tala, see my buddy, Matt, Timmy and Mizzle and all those guys from Boreal and diamond peak. And just buddy TJ that's over there now, like so many good friends all over the place. And just, I just want to be able to enjoy my life and provide for my family as much as I can. And luckily I got a badass wife that does the majority of that right now. So Give her an air horn. <laughs> that's tight. <laughs> yeah. Allie's the shit. Um, yeah, I just want to be able to spend time with them and raise my kid. And yeah. You think Rosie's going to have the cab seven in the pipe or what? Hopefully she has whatever she wants to have. That's the right That's the main goal. Right answer, I guess. If she wants to do one, I'd be fucking proud. What's your local <laughs> resort going to be? Um, I'm not sure, really. Yeah. I think there's a, there's this little place called Powderhouse Hill. It's got it's a good name. right across the river in Maine that's open like a couple of days a week, a couple hours at a time. It's like a municipal oh, really? ski resort. It's a handle tow, no park, no nothing. Just a little rope and a trail. Yeah. But then I think Gunstock's not too far away. Loon. Loon is fun as shit, dude. Yeah. I'm hyped to Loon's go see it. Like, those dudes are fucking beasts. They're all so rad. I'd love to just go get a pass and just go fucking ride over there as much as we can. But And they know how to make a good park, that's for sure. Yes, they do. And at this point, it's like I definitely want to go ride places where there's half pipes. Cause it's uh, one of those things. It's just super fun to snowboard in and mm-hmm. work yourself in. <laughs> Junior's been hitting that indoor spot. That looks kind of sick for the summer. Oh too. yeah, big snow American dream or yeah. whatever. I yeah. don't know what it's called, but it looks kind of cool. It's in Northern Jersey. Yeah, that's crazy. It's in Jersey. Yeah, anything's crazy in Jersey. Yeah. Speaking of way, did you guys see Class Action Park yet? Uh. Uh-uh. Holy shit, Action Park. You ever been? Oh yeah. Okay, there's an HBO special called Class Action Park, and it's like documentary on Action Park. Like all the shit like, that happened there. Like like uh, class action suits against them, yeah. basically. Because <laughs> I always always hear crazy stories about shit that goes down there and people you've getting been to, worked. You've been to Mountain Creek, right? Oh yeah. Okay, so back in the day before, his Mountain Creek was Action Park, and in the summertime was a full like water park, crazy water park. It was like people would be like, you should build a slide like this. And a bunch of people would think it up and build it and open it to the public, and it was fucked up. People were getting like, jacked. Crazy people would get worked, but it was so fun. Like, I remember going there when I was a little kid a couple of times. Me too. That's where Danny's from. And we go down there to see him in the summertime and cruise over there and just be like, what the hell? Like, they had indie car, like, full-on, like, high-powered go-karts, but you had to have a driver's license to drive them. But they had, like, bungee towers, human slingshots, like, the full loop water slides. Like yeah, they had a loop. Lifts. Like People would get jammed up in yeah. that loop, dude. <laughs> so much bad shit would happen there, but it was so fun. So they got an HBO special where we can see all the fucked up shit. <laughs> yeah. It's me. like an hour and a half of your life, but you will not regret it. <laughs> yeah, that sounds amazing, because I just remember hearing urban legends about wild shit going down. Same, yeah. They had the sickest rope swings in the water, just everything fun you could Yeah, the imagine. Tarzan swing. Yeah, that was one of my favorites, yep. the Tarzan swing. It was a, yeah, it's a pretty cool ship. Yeah. It's one of the things you got to check out. Beauty. I haven't thought of that place in a while. Let's take Throw that in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Throw a link. <laughs> Throw a link to Action Park. <laughs> All right, Laser. I think we fucking did it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming, Laser. Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Love you guys. Appreciate Love it. Love you, dog. Fun. Much respect. Enjoy the East. I'm kind of jealous. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate right. you guys listening and we appreciate you guys watching. We will see you next week over and out from the bomb hole.